Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasting. Imagine getting into a relationship that is so controlling that you begin to lose touch with your friends and family. The isolation, while gradual at first, becomes so complete that it takes nearly three years before anyone realizes that you've gone missing. As unbelievable as it may sound, that's exactly what happened to Fawn Mountain. Fawn was in a relationship with a woman named Heather Dybert, and she was so far under Heather's control that she eventually lost all ties to the outside world. On the evening of November 5th, 2012, Fawn went into the trailer that she shared with her partner, Heather. By the next morning, she was gone, and no one has seen her since. It wouldn't be until April 2015 that Fawn's family would realize she had been gone for years, and they filed a missing persons report. Now, in 2023, a high-profile arrest has the possibility of leading to justice for Fawn Marie Mountain. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of Fawn Mountain. I'm Kona Gallagher, and this is And Then They Were Gone. back everyone thank you for joining me once again i am kona and i'm usually joined here by my husband ethan but he is out of town this week so i am just doing it on my own this is kind of an update episode not on a case that we've actually covered but on a case that we did have in our feed our friend and head of darkcast network cj hosts a podcast called Beyond the Rainbow. She covered Fawn's case, and we did a feed drop of that episode on September 4th, 2022. This past week, CJ messaged me to let me know that there has been an arrest. Unfortunately, this arrest wasn't in Fawn's case, but there's a strong possibility that this could lead to some movement on that front. So this is a bit of an odd episode, but... I wanted to make sure to get this information out there and hopefully give Fawn's case more publicity and pressure Pennsylvania State Police into, frankly, doing more. Next week, we should be back on track with our regular content. But for now, let's get into the update on Fawn Mountain. Fawn Marie Mountain was born on March 2nd, 1987 in Altoona, Pennsylvania to Dorothy Mountain. Fawn is one of two children and has a brother, Alan. Fawn has been described as sweet and loving. She's the type of person who will do anything for you. And all right, that might not sound like anything too earth shattering, but I do find it remarkable that Fawn was able to maintain such a sweet nature after experiencing so many hardships in life. As a child, Fawn was the victim of both physical and sexual abuse. Perhaps because of this, Fawn seemed to be on an endless quest for love. Fawn's case hasn't gotten a ton of media coverage, so we don't know a whole lot of details about her background. So, for instance, I don't have exact dates, but when she was young, likely a teenager, Fawn became involved with a man who was abusive toward her. She eventually had two children with him, and after many years of horrible abuse, he left her. Unfortunately, as is the case in many abusive relationships, Fawn didn't see this as a chance for freedom and healing. She saw it as rejection. In her mind, it meant that she wasn't good enough. This led to her attempting to cope using drugs and alcohol. Fawn spiraled so far down that she eventually lost custody of her two children. Several years later, Fawn became pregnant again, only to have one of the worst things possible happen. Her baby was stillborn. Fawn named her daughter Caden and had her cremated. Fawn kept her baby close and carried her ashes with her everywhere. In 2009, Fawn believed that her life was starting to look up when she met Heather Dybert in a bar. Fawn had never been in a relationship with a woman before, but Heather came in and swept her off her feet. 
Heather was about six years older than Fawn and probably seemed sure of herself and what she wanted and what she wanted was Fawn. The two dated for a few months and then moved in together. Heather started showing her true colors almost immediately. She was extremely possessive of Fawn and didn't like her girlfriend spending time with other people. Fawn was actually flattered by what she saw as Heather's protective concern for her. Sometimes when you're dealing with a controlling relationship, it can be a little bit like a frog in boiling water. At first, it just seems as though the person is caring and protective, but then they start controlling more and more. You can only talk to certain people. You can only go to certain places at certain times. And in extreme cases, you become a literal prisoner. Fawn's family saw this happening. They cared about her, and Fawn was close with her mother, brother, and her cousin, Bridget Gill. But they began seeing less and less of Fawn. Heather was slowly but surely isolating Fawn from her loved ones and making her completely dependent on her. Fawn was not permitted to get a job, and eventually she couldn't even have possession of her own cell phone. Heather had calls made to Fawn forwarded directly to her. But soon this wasn't even enough for Heather. Even though Fawn had no job and no phone, Heather was still concerned that her partner would be going out and doing things that she didn't approve of. So to mitigate this, Heather would often have Fawn come to work with her. But Fawn wouldn't actually go to work. She would be locked in the car while Heather worked her shift. Heather would even set the car alarm so that if Fawn got out, she would know. On days that Heather didn't do this, she would leave Fawn at home in their trailer, but she would padlock it from the outside in order to ensure that Fawn could not leave. What's even more chilling about this story is that Heather allegedly had help from her family. On the day she would leave Fawn locked in the trailer, she would have her mother go by and check on Fawn to make sure that she wasn't doing anything that Heather didn't approve of. Heather's brother, Mike, lived in the trailer next door with his girlfriend, Stephanie. Stephanie wasn't really a fan of Heather or what she was doing to Fawn. On the days when Fawn was locked in the trailer, the two women would have conversations through the windows. That is, of course, until Heather's mother found this out. She reported back to Heather and Heather boarded up the windows to keep the two from communicating. Occasionally, Fawn would escape, and having no money or resources, she would always run to her mother Dorothy's house. Heather would eventually find out and bang on the door until Fawn came out and went back home with her. In addition to being held prisoner, Fawn was the victim of physical abuse. The police were called to their home many times, but according to court records, the worst thing that came out of these repeated calls was a 2010 charge of harassment subject to other physical contact that was withdrawn and a guilty plea to a noise complaint in early 2012. And this noise complaint was allegedly due to a fight that Heather and Fawn had been having. And the police got there and Fawn told them that she was being held there and felt like she couldn't leave and that Heather controlled everything. And the police are like, okay, well, leave though. Don't come back here. In other words, they did nothing to help. Fawn reportedly needed to go to the hospital so many times for her injuries that doctors became suspicious, forcing Heather to start taking Fawn to different hospitals. According to Dorothy, one of the times that she saw her daughter during all of this, she had bruises all over her neck from Heather strangling her. This in particular is important because out of all of the possible manners of physical abuse, Strangulation is the single biggest predictor of homicide in abusive relationships. If your partner tries to strangle you, there is a 750% increase in the likelihood that your partner will use a gun to murder you within the next year. If there have been multiple strangulations, this number rises exponentially. There's a passage in a March 2023 article in the Daily Press written by Jamie Marshall that I find particularly interesting. It reads, quote, Strangulation indicates a particular dynamic, coercive control. When a victim's throat lays in the hands of their abuser, a message is sent, one that says, I can kill you at any time, end quote. Coercive control was a hallmark of Heather and Fawn's relationship. 
Heather would tell Fawn that if she ever left her, she would throw Caden's ashes in the trash. This dynamic, however, wasn't unique to Heather's relationship with Fawn. According to Mike's girlfriend, Stephanie, she was concerned about Fawn's safety because at least four of Heather's former partners had filed restraining or protective orders against her. A 2019 WTAJ article would amend that number to six. On the Bring Fawn Marie Home Facebook page, a woman named Brittany shared her story of being married to Heather, though I don't know if their relationship was before or after Fawn. It reads in part, quote, Next thing I know, she had me quit my job, which led to my car getting repoed. Then it turned into I had no phone and wasn't allowed to communicate with friends or family. We were isolated. The last thing gone was my kid's father. She made me go to the courthouse and file charges on him for touching her daughter, and it never happened. But it was that or something would happen. After that, I literally had no one I could run to for help at all. Anytime she went anywhere, I couldn't stay home. We had to go along. And if we stay home, she had her mom come check on us to make sure I was there and I guess making sure I wasn't doing any, quote, sneaky shit, end quote. This account sounds almost word for word what happened to Fawn. Except Fawn didn't get out. In February 2011, Fawn decided to risk it all in a bid for freedom. On this day, Fawn was locked in the car as Heather worked. She decided to make a run for it despite knowing that this would set off the alarm and notify Heather. She was able to get to a phone and called a friend to pick her up and take her back to the trailer so she could retrieve Caden's ashes. The friend took her, but when Fawn arrived, the trailer was locked. Desperate to get Caden's ashes, Fawn broke the lock and went in. Heather knew what Fawn was doing, so she called the cops and told them that Fawn was breaking into her home. Fawn was charged with felony burglary and trespassing in order to pay a $2,700 fine. That wasn't enough for Heather, though. She wanted to make sure that if Fawn tried to escape again, that she had nowhere to go. Later that year, Fawn filed a restraining order against Dorothy. Everyone, of course, believed that Heather forced her into doing this, but it worked. Fawn could no longer run to her mother. In October 2012, however, she did try. Fawn escaped once again and went to her mother's home. Heather called the police and told them that Dorothy was violating the restraining order. Police arrested her and Dorothy spent two days in jail. This was the last time that Dorothy ever saw her daughter. Despite this, Dorothy called the police and requested several welfare checks. Each time, they were satisfied that Fawn was fine. The last one was in November of 2012. Later that month, November 25th, 2012, Fawn accompanied Heather to her family's butcher shop, where they, along with Mike and Stephanie, helped Heather's parents clean and sterilize all of the equipment for deer hunting season. According to Stephanie, Fawn was in a good mood that day and said that she was looking forward to going home and watching horror movies. The next morning, Heather's parents came out to the trailer to pick everyone up to come back and help at the butcher shop. But Fawn wasn't there. When Stephanie realized this, she asked Heather where Fawn was. Heather calmly told her that she woke up that morning at 3.30 to go to the bathroom only to find that Fawn had disappeared. She looked for her, but just assumed that Fawn had run away again. Despite Heather's long history of losing her fucking mind when Fawn tried to escape her clutches, Stephanie said that there were no such histrionics this time. Heather didn't go looking for Fawn after that alleged first search, nor did she contact Dorothy, Fawn's friends, or the police. Stephanie was already growing worried, but was filled with dread once she realized that Vaughn didn't take anything with her, not even Caden's ashes. Stephanie contacted Dorothy, who immediately called the police, but they did nothing. They bought the story that Vaughn left on her own and never filed a missing persons report. 
A week after Fawn was last seen, Heather and her father removed and replaced all of the carpet and floorboards in the trailer. A week after that, Heather left and moved to Ohio. She returned to Pennsylvania a few months later with a new girlfriend in tow. About six months after Fawn went missing, the Dieberts sold their butcher shop, including most of their equipment. Fawn had been so isolated from her family that it was years before anyone truly understood that she was missing. In 2015, Fawn's stepfather was in the hospital dying. He wanted to see Fawn before it was too late. Fawn's uncle contacted Heather, and it was only then that he and the rest of the family found out that Heather hadn't seen Fawn in nearly three years. Fawn's family contacted police once again, but they still did nothing. Fortunately, the family realized that Fawn's social security checks were still being sent to Heather's address. They filed a complaint with the Social Security office, and when Fawn never appeared in person to collect her money, the police finally agreed to file a missing persons report. According to a Change.org petition started by Fawn's cousin Bridget, even then, the Greenfield Township police did the bare minimum. They took statements from friends and neighbors, but according to Bridget, they were subsequently lost. The officer in charge of Fawn's case had also been fired and no one else was ever put on her case after that. This caused Fawn's case to go cold, purely through inaction. The case wouldn't be transferred to Pennsylvania State Police until 2017, nearly five years after Fawn was last seen. After finding all of this out, Bridget began to take the lead in getting justice for Fawn. She had billboards erected and raised $10,000 for a reward. The reward now sits at $20,000 thanks to a donation from YouTuber Kendall Ray earlier this year. Bridget contacted news agencies and held candlelight vigils. Despite this, police seemingly still haven't done much of an investigation. And because of that, Heather has never been named as a suspect or even as a person of interest in this case. As disheartening as that is, it doesn't mean that all hope is lost for Fawn. Because Heather has been up to her old tricks. Heather has a lengthy criminal history that started back in 2003, well before meeting Fawn, and has continued to this day. She's been arrested for assault, passing bad checks, thefts, all sorts of things. She is currently married, and according to court records, Heather has been escalating her violent behavior. On October 18th, 2023, just a few months prior to this recording, Heather was arrested in Blair County, Pennsylvania, and charged with terroristic threats with intent to terrorize another, simple assault, unlawful restraint slash serious bodily injury, disorderly conduct engage in fighting, and harassment subject to other physical contact. She spent the night in jail before posting 10% of her $10,000 bond the next day. The last status update was on November 30th when the charges were held for court with her arraignment scheduled for January 5th, 2024. But that's not what prompted me to do this episode. The reason I'm bringing all of this to you today is because this arrest made Heather angry. So angry, in fact, that she allegedly hired someone to kill her wife and her family. Just 10 days after she was released on bail, Heather allegedly gave a man named Zachary Sellers a combination of money and drugs to burn down the house where her wife was staying with five other people. Shortly after midnight on October 28, 2023, Sellers headed to Napier Township to do just that. At the same time, Heather was traveling down to a strip club in Martinsburg, West Virginia, seemingly in hopes of building an alibi. Police used a combination of messages between Heather and Zach Sellers and their cell phone pings in order to build their case. Thankfully, Sellers wasn't extremely competent, and while he did throw a Molotov cocktail at the home with the intent of burning it down, he threw it on a porch. Family members inside realized that there was a fire and easily extinguished it. The only damage was to the porch itself, the siding, and some plastic toys. 
Police, of course, started looking into Heather immediately as she had just been arrested on those charges related to her wife. Despite the fact that police were already investigating her, Heather was arrested again on November 17th for violating the protective order that her wife had placed against her. Zachary Sellers was arrested on December 12th, and he immediately gave Heather up, telling police that after he had expressed concern about the fact that there were other people in the home, including children, Heather allegedly responded with, quote, kill them all, end quote. Heather was arrested shortly thereafter on 32 felony charges and seven misdemeanors. The charges are as follows. Six counts of conspiracy, aggravated arson, bodily injury. Twelve counts of conspiracy, aggravated arson, person present inside the property. Six counts of criminal solicitation, aggravated assault. One count of criminal solicitation, attempt solicitation, conspiring to commit murder. One count of criminal attempt, attempt solicitation, conspiring to commit murder. Four counts of attempt solicitation conspiring to commit murder, one count of solicitation, one count of criminal solicitation, arson, endangering property, and reckless endangerment of inhabited buildings, and six misdemeanor charges of criminal solicitation, criminal homicide, one count of criminal solicitation, criminal mischief, damage property by intent, recklessness, or negligence. Heather's bail is currently set at $1 million. She remains in custody with her preliminary hearing scheduled for December 20th. We, of course, will keep you updated. Though these charges have nothing to do with Fawn's case, they, along with the other protective orders levied against Heather Dibert by past partners, show a pattern of violence and coercive behavior. Despite Vaughn's case gaining some level of notoriety in the past several years, Heather has been allowed to continue to terrorize the people whom she claims to love. Pennsylvania narrowly avoided having the blood of half a dozen dead bodies on their hands. Let's hope that they use this arrest as an opportunity to not only get Heather Dibert off the streets for good, but to get some sort of justice for Fawn Mountain and answers for her family. has been missing from Claysburg, Pennsylvania since November 26, 2012. Fawn is a white female with brown hair and blue eyes. Her ears and lip are pierced. She has a large tattoo on her back of an angel with wings and the words R.I.P. Caden and a tattoo of the name Brayden on her neck. Fawn was 5'2 and approximately 105 pounds at the time of her disappearance. She was 25 when she went missing. She would be 36 today. Anyone with information on the disappearance of Fawn Mountain is urged to call the Pennsylvania State Police at 814-696-6100. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. And don't forget to like us on social media. We're on Facebook at and then they were gone pod and on Instagram and TikTok at ATTWG pod. Also, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It'll help new listeners find us. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research writing and editing is done by me, Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!